This is Asian Insider and I'm Nirmal Ghosh. Now, the spread of the new coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, has been both relentless and rapid. Countries in the region and around the world, including in North America, are stepping up preventive measures and surveillance. Now, part of this involves sharply cutting back on contact with China. So we are seeing flights cancelled, visas denied and so forth. And this is having an economic effect, which is really only just beginning. Hotels, airlines, conferences... Uh, and exhibitions, supply chains, the ramifications are deep and wide for economies, especially in the region. So today we have on the line Dr. Stephen Hatfield, who is an American physician, virologist and bioweapons expert. Dr. Hatfield is also a former biodefense defense researcher for the United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. And in Singapore, where she is actually in quarantine in her apartment after coming back from China, but thankfully in good health, is the Straits Times China correspondent Elizabeth Law. Hi, Liz. Good morning. Are you okay? Are you Hi. out there? I, I am. I'm, I'm good. I'm, in, I'm well. Hi, Nama. Hi, Dr. Nice Hatfield. To have you, nice Hello, to have you back on the show. Dr. Hatfield, hi. Thanks for spending Hello. your time. Uh, sparing some time for us. So, it's my pleasure. Uh, Dr. Hatfield, perhaps I should start with you. The speed of the spread of this virus has gotten people worried. And the problem appears to be that asymptomatic people are carriers and spreaders. So the virus has sort of flown the coop before China could gear up the response. What is your assessment looking at the, the data that you're seeing? If you could sort of spell it out a bit for us. What is your impression of this virus? The data that I'm getting out of China uh, keeps changing, and it's a rather confusing. I've seen RO numbers from 4 all the way to uh, 3.7, and it's come down since then. Um, it's hard to say what it is. In the United States, we're having some secondary cases now, secondary transmissions, and it seems it is still at a manageable level. But okay. you need to remember Sorry, these are RNA viruses. And they replicate, they make mistakes, they're constantly changing. Okay. And Liz, what is the view from Singapore where you are? What is the tell me something about the mood out there? Right. So there has, in the initial days, I think people got a little bit panicky. Um, but I think the government, the Singapore government has mounted quite a robust response. Um, they have, they, they keep having to reassure people because in the early days, masks were getting sold out uh, in stores. And uh, you were now seeing prices of like $200 for a box of masks online, which is just ridiculous. So um, the government has been, has been reassuring people that um, there are sufficient masks. They are giving out... Uh, uh, face masks to surgical masks to families uh, to households to make sure and uh, that in case in the inevitability that uh, something is wrong with you and you need to go to doctor at least every household would have um, some sort of protection uh, to be able to wear outside and also of course uh, yesterday we've seen um, an increase in the number of cases we've seen our first Singaporean case here as well which is uh, slightly worrying bec uh, because it's, it is the first local case but to be fair she also went uh, to Wuhan on holiday so it, there isn't a community spread here per se which is what everyone is worried about so in, in a sense that still is pretty much under control. That's interesting. Dr. Hatfield what typically lies no. ahead? I mean what, what various parts could lie ahead? We so with SARS that it, it appeared to sort of disappear. And then we also have now a, um, a race to develop a vaccine, of course. But we don't know, of yeah. course, when this, if and when this virus will peak. Could you give us a we little can't. bit of a sense? It's hard to say. Um, mm -hmm. RNA viruses as a whole have an error-prone genetic replication mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, so... When you have a viral infection, uh, you, it's actually a, a number of viruses with very, very, very slight mutations. We call them quasi-species. And for the virus, this is an evolutionary advantage. You know, for an animal virus to live in a human is not a straightforward proposition. The pHs are different. The immune system, uh, acid-base balance, everything is different. And the virus has to undergo a bit of a, a learning curve to become adapted to man to where it efficiently spreads person to person. 
I, I think it's still in the phase for this, uh, at least in the cases we're getting over here. I'd like to add, I use the public health system in Singapore as an example of the correct way to do things in situations like this. I know some of your researchers, I've, I've met Singaporean researchers at conferences, and I'm very, very highly impressed, uh, both with public health and with the government's cooperation with public health. This is critical for managing any type of an outbreak like this. At the moment, we're lucky. Um, the virus seems to be manageable in the United States, and I think in Singapore. There's no firm reason that it has to stay that way. Um, these viruses can do three things. They can become less contagious and more infective. They can become more infective, less contagious. Well, sorry, more contagious, more lethal, less contagious, less lethal, or a combination. We don't know at this stage what, what this is going to do. Um, it may take only one or two mutations to change the clinical picture of this viral infection. So we're watching this very, very carefully. Is there also the possibility that uh, if it stays around uh, and spreads, that uh, populations will eventually develop immunity to it? I mean, I know, I know this is somewhat uh, speculative, but that no, no, has happened no. with viruses, right? We, we see this. If you go to parts of Africa where Ebola hasn't been reported, you can find 9 to maybe sometimes 15% of the population have Ebola antibodies. They've uh, contracted a subclinical infection. Um, it looks like many of the cases of this uh, new coronavirus cause subclinical infections. Uh, you, so you gather a partial immunity without going through all the pain. Uh, eventually, a population tends to build up a herd immunity. Uh, if it's a very lethal disease, which this is not at this point, uh, there's a lot of self-quarantining, reverse quarantining going on. People become frightened, and they do their own social distancing measures. Uh -huh. um, it's not that point here. People are buying masks, but uh, the uh, the social distancing measures uh, haven't haven't been implemented yet. Right, um, Liz, could I bring you in on one of the aspects which I had mentioned at the top, which is the economic um, impact? Um, what is the economic impact? in the region, in Singapore and in the region, and is there worry about the economic impact? Mm. I think, Nirmal, we, we, we spoke about this um, the last episode that we did together as well, and I said that, bearing in mind, this is a, this is a region, especially East Asia, China, uh, mainland China, and of course Hong Kong, it's, it is a region that is still reeling from the impact of um, the months-long protests that have been going on in Hong Kong. So we have gone into 2020 already slight, slightly weakened with an Asian financial centre still in, in, in a sort of state where it is, it is not doing well. And now with this, it, me it means that because, like, Singapore is going to ban all travelers with travel history to mainland China and also all holders of um, Chinese passports unless in very special uh, condition, case by case basis, they'll allow them in. Um, but the fact that Singapore and and now the US earlier this morning have decided that they're going to close their borders to Chinese tourists, which are a, a, a very big um, source of tourism revenue, I think that that is going to be quite a significant impact. The Singaporean Prime Minister has also warned that there will be several sectors that are going to be affected. And of course, with people going out a lot less across the region, you can imagine this is, this is just going to be a ripple on effect throughout, well, whether it be it in, in Southeast Asia and East Asia, or I imagine the rest of the world as well. It's just a matter of time how, how long this um, takes to actually feel the full effects of it. Um, but the Singapore government has said that they will be announcing uh, measures to help uh, to help the economy and to help those who are going to be affected by this. So uh, that information will be coming out later today. 
Is there any, um, have there been any incidents or is there any concern about uh, what, you know, can be, is being called in some, in some cases racism about, you know, um, China, people from mainland China being sort of discriminated against? There's a lot of that happening, unfortunately, online. Have there been any reports mm. in that region? Uh, we have we have seen quite we have seen quite a lot of it, and in fact, even within China itself, um, we've actually seen that there are people who are discriminatory towards uh, Wuhan people. Some uh, on Chinese social media, some landlords whose tenants uh, were from Wuhan have actually said, "You know what? Don't come back after the New Year break. I don't I don't want to rent my house to you anymore." Which um, it's, it's actually it's very sad and, slight, and slightly worrying as well. That And it actually prompted a senior government official to say during a press conference uh, two days ago that the virus is our real enemy, not the people of Wuhan. I mean, the fact that the government has to come out to say something like that, I think it is significant uh, that oh, what Beijing absolutely. is worried about. Yeah, and of course, in, in Singapore online, it's, it's just been absolutely horrible as well. I mean, people in normal circumstances on the internet under the cloak of anonymity, terrible, terrible people. People who have been cooped up at home huh. on the internet under anonymity, oh my God, it's 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 just unbelievable. It's, it's been really horrible. But uh, fortunately here in Singapore, it's uh, it's been a little bit more under control because obviously there are very strict laws here governing what you can say about race and about xenophobia be uh, because there are sedition acts. Uh -huh. uh, back, sorry, let me do that again. Uh, that it's There are laws governing sedition and xenophobia. So uh, people do have to be a lot more careful. And of course, I think one thing that is not just about... Um, that sort of hatred towards people from China, but rather also one very big problem here has been a lot of misinformation that has been going around. Uh, so the government has put into, has used this newly uh, enacted law, uh, the prevention of online falsehoods law to really clamp down on all of this. And I think that has gone some way in sort of um, calming people down. Okay, interesting, interesting. Dr. Hatfield, um, are we potentially also looking at just a new strain of uh, flu like H1N1, which will kill maybe, I hate to sort of talk about people as numbers, but which will kill maybe thousands, in fact, millions, but basically stay with us and become part of the menu of diseases that are out there. And then we, you know, we, at some point we'll get a vaccine. At this stage, um, let's put it into comparison. From 2019 till today, we've had 8,000 people die in the United States from influenza. Uh -huh. the, we have, what, 25 million people quarantined in China and somewhere around 200 deaths. So we're a far cry away from something like a 1918 influenza pandemic uh -huh. at this stage and if the virus remains relatively stable uh, and maintains an RO number that is manageable and a mortality that's manageable then uh, there, there's every indication as long as we don't become overwhelmed with cases entering the country that, that uh -huh. this can be this can be managed. It's um, it's this case contact tracing process is very labor intensive and time intensive. So it's important to keep it at a level that can be managed. All we have at the moment for this virus, should it change and become worse, are social distancing measures. We call these non-pharmaceutical interventions, or NPI. These are common sense things. Cough etiquette, i.e. cough into your sleeve rather than an unprotected cough or wear a mask as well. Frequent washing of hands because we know this is contact transmitted. Um, maintaining some degree of, of social distancing. Um, this may get to the point where 
you close the movie theaters. China's done that. Uh-huh. Um, you stay at least uh, three feet away from someone when you're communicating with them. These type of things uh, that are easily done, but the population has to be educated a little bit. And this can be done through mass media. If the virus changes its lethality, this will bring a variety of other problems. Um, at the moment, we're a little concerned about the supply chain. The United States keeps a just-in-time inventory for most medical items. Uh -huh. uh, if, you go, if you go on Amazon right now and try to purchase an N95 mask or an N100 mask, they're all on back order. Uh, we have an additional problem here because the mo majority of our vaccines are made overseas. Uh -huh. uh, we've taken steps as a nation to bring uh, strategically vaccine production back to the U.S., but uh, this is still a ways off. Uh -huh. Singapore has normally their, their response during the SARS outbreak in 2003 uh, was just simply exemplary. They, today today we, we initiated uh, voluntary you know home quarantine. but uh, when, that, when that was done in Singapore, it, it was checked on. Uh, uh -huh. If you were assigned home quarantine, the police would phone or, or a public uh -huh. health worker would phone your house and you'd better be home. If you don't answer the phone, after so many tries, the police would come by. Uh -huh. Well, that's, that's fairly effective home quarantine. Um, we're not doing that here uh -huh. yet. So... If I had any place to be, I'd probably want to be in Singapore right now. Thank you. Thank you, Vinny, for ending on that note. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Hatfield, thanks a lot for being with us, for spending your time uh, for this uh, show. And uh, Liz, thank you very much and stay well in Singapore. Thank you, Nirmal. Thank you, Dr. Hatfield. So the virus has broken out and is spreading, but we are seeing a very robust international response to it now, gearing up only now. Yes, there's going to be there are going to be economic ramifications, but we will have to see which direction this goes in in the next few days, maybe a couple of weeks. For Asian Insider, I'm Nirmal Ghosh.